Well, welcome to chapter 11. Y'all, we only have two chapters left. I know you've worked so hard this semester and you're probably so ready for this semester to be over, but hang in there with me for just two more chapters, just a few more videos, and I promise we're going to make it through this course together. So in chapter 10, we were looking at the difference between two means so quantitative data, and here in chapter 11, we're going to be looking at the difference between two proportions. So looking at it if we have qualitative data. So remember, if we have qualitative data, we're looking at the proportion, for example, which we denote with a P. So if we have purport samples from two different populations, then our sample proportion for, let's say, population 1 would be x1, where x is the number of successes in population 1, or in sample of population 1, divided by n1, the sample size in sample population 1, where p2, again, is the number of successes in population 2 divided by the sample size of population um, 2, or the population 2 sample. So the standard error for any two, these are independently drawn samples, let's keep that in mind, is going to be the square root of P1, so the proportion I'll sample 1 times 1 minus the proportion I'll sample 1 divided by the sample size in 1, and plus the same thing for sample 2 out of population 2. Now remember, we've talked about this before, we've done this in an earlier chapter, we have to make sure that both sample 1 and sample 2 are sufficiently large so that we can assume a normal distribution. So one of the things we'll be testing, just like we did before, is to test the sample size to make sure that it's large enough, and we'll do that on an upcoming slide. Now, we don't know the standard error, so again, we've estimated it, we've looked at that, so we can go ahead and compute our confidence interval by just like we've done confidence intervals so far where we have the, the proportion from one minus the proportion of two plus or minus the z-score where alpha is divided by two because it's a two-tail divided uh, multiplied by the square root of the standard error. Okay. So remember our guideline for our sample sizes to make sure that they are large enough is that N1 times P1 has to be greater than or equal to 5, and N1 times 1 minus P1 has to be greater than or equal to 5. Now, we've done that before, but now we're going to have to do it for both samples. So we're going to have to do it for N2 and P2 also to make sure that all four of those um, are greater than or equal to 5. Now, our hypothesis test is very similar to, again, to what we did in Chapter 10, assuming that we're looking for the difference to where we are calculating the difference. Assuming we want the difference to be zero, we're going to designate that as D0. So remember, our null hypothesis is always the status quo, and it's always one that has the equality in it. So it's either P1 minus P2 is equal to the difference is zero, or P1 minus P2 is less than or equal to zero, or P1 minus P2 is greater than or equal to zero. Then the alternative hypothesis is what we're actually testing. So in the case of the first one on the left there, P1 minus P2 does not equal zero, if we're using zero as our hypothesized difference. Then we're not saying which one is greater, we're just saying they're not the same, they're not equal. So remember, that's a two-tailed test. But if we're looking at an equality, an inequality rather, where we're saying like P1 minus P2 is greater than zero, then that right-tailed test says, hey, we're really testing to see if P1 is greater than P2. And then for the left-tailed test, we're really testing to see if P2 is greater than P1. So P1 minus P2 would be less than zero. Now, it, we don't always have to use zero. We saw that in chapter 10, and we're going to look at an example of that here in this video also. So what do we do if we don't want to test that the difference is just not zero? What if we want to see if it's, you know, 20% or something like that? We'll see how we're going to test that. Now, 
And these, we don't have the easy way to do this in Excel like we did before. So we're going to have to calculate these z-scores actually by hand. So on your formula sheet, you're going to want to write out these z-scores. Now we can calculate these in Excel and we will, but there's not like an easy button or function to use in Excel to just say, hey, press this button and it'll calculate the z-score for us. So we are going to have to use this kind of messy formula. It's not terrible, but we're going to use this. Now, this formula, and you want to highlight star this in your notes, this formula, this z-score formula right here that I'm kind of circling with my cursor, is only used if the hypothesized difference is zero. So you want to highlight star, underline that in your notes. If the hypothesized difference is not zero, if we're hypothesizing that, for example, the difference is, you know, 20%, then we're going to use a different formula that we'll see on the next slide. So notice down in the denominator, we just have p-bar. p-bar, instead of not for population one or population two, it's just p-bar. So that is saying that is like the grouped um, probability. So if we're testing that the probabilities are different, then the null hypothesis is that both of the probabilities are the same. So we're going to come up with a grouped probability, which is just x1 plus x2, the number of successes in 1 plus the number of successes in 2, divided by the sample size of 1 plus the sample size of 2. So that's our um, data point that we'll use in the denominator there. So just pay it careful attention when you're writing down that formula. Now, as I said, if the hypothesized difference is not zero, then we have to use a slightly different formula. So notice the numerator is not just P1 minus P2, it's P1 minus P2 minus the hypothesized difference. And then our denominator, which is always the standard error, is different because now we're saying we're hypothesizing or we're saying that the population proportions are not the same. Um, so even our null hypothesis is that they're not the same. So we have to calculate the, we have to, we don't use that um, grouped probability. We mean probability, we just um, do them separately. So again, make sure when you write these down in your formula sheets that you title them correctly. If the hypothesized difference is zero, we use the formula on the previous slide. If the hypothesized difference is not zero, we use the formula on this slide. So we're going to look at some data here and then we're going to jump into Excel and just do the calculations in Excel. So here we're told that we have some researchers who claim that there are some gender differences. <coughs> Pardon me. That is not a COVID cough. It is 2020, but I promise that's not a COVID cough. <clears throat> I was eating something before I recorded the video and it's just caught in my throat. Um, researchers claim that there are differences when it comes to shopping in gender. So a survey revealed that 5,400 out of 6,000 men said they make purchases online regularly or occasionally compared to 8,600 out of 10,000 women surveyed. So assuming a 5% significance level, we want to test whether the proportion of men who make purchases online is greater than the proportion of women who make purchases online. So we're going to define P1 or population 1 as men and population 2 as women. So we're going to test if P1 is greater than P2. In other words, we could say that our alternative hypothesis is that P1 minus P2 is greater than zero, okay? So again, I find it easier a lot of times to start with the alternative hypothesis because that's really what we're testing, and then we can back into the null hypothesis. So we just set our hypothesis. We think we're testing what we think is that men are shop online more than women. So mathematically, if we were to rearrange this formula, add the P2 to the other side of the alternative hypothesis, we're really testing is P1 greater than P2. Um, so if you convert it like this and use it as a zero, we're testing whether P1 minus P2 is greater than zero. That would imply that P1 was greater than zero, it was greater than P2. So now we can back into our, altern our null hypothesis by it's just the opposite. So it would be less than or equal to zero. 
meaning there's no difference, or women shop online more than men. So now we can go ahead and compute our sample proportions. So for P1, it's just the number of successes, 5,400, divided by the sample size, which is 6,000. And then for P2, for the women, it's the number of successes of 8,600 divided by the sample size of 10,000. So we get that 90% of men shop online versus only 86% of women regularly shop online. Now, the question is at a 5% significance level, is this statistically different? Okay. Now, they tell us that the normality condition has been met because N1, P1, and N2, P2, and all of that all exceed 5, but of course, we're going to check that out for ourselves. So the first thing that we want to do is go ahead and calculate that grouped or pooled proportion because this is a test that involves zero, so we're going to use that first formula that we looked at. So we're going to say x1 plus x2 divided by n1 plus n2 gives us 0.875. So notice that it falls in the middle of our two proportions. Our proportion of men was 90%. Our proportion of women is 86. So this is basically kind of an average of the proportions, right? It's kind of, it's a weighted average though. You can't just average them. It's a weighted average. So here's a clue. Anytime you're calculating this, your pooled proportion can never be outside of those limits. It has to fall between P1 and P2, right? And so then we're going to just look at the math here, but like I said, we're going to jump in Excel in just a minute and do it together. So we can go ahead and calculate our test statistic by just plugging in our data, and we get a z-score of 7.41. So this is where we could look up in the z-table to see where what probability 7.41 falls in, or as we're going to use in Excel, we're going to use that norm.s.district. DIST uh, function to calculate the p-value for us, okay? So before we get there, our p-value, remember we're calculating the probability that z is greater than or equal to 7.1. For one. So it's really important to keep that in mind that we're calculating a greater than or equal to here. We're calculating the probability that's greater than or equal to because remember our, our formula in Excel is always calculating the left tail and this is a right tailed test. So we're going to have to use that one minus in Excel as we'll see in just a minute. So let's jump over to Excel now. We don't have a chapter 11 Excel workbook um, like you have for some of the other chapters. So I'm just gonna open up a blank Excel spreadsheet and we're gonna enter our data together and then calculate this. All right, so I've just got a blank Excel spreadsheet pulled up here and I'm gonna start by just entering some data just so that we have it here and we can do all of our calculations in Excel if we didn't want to necessarily maybe do them on our calculator. So first of all, I've got in one, my sample size for one was 6,000, and therefore P1 is the 5,400 divided by my N1, my sample size, I get 0.9. I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna do N2 was 10,000, and therefore, P2 was 8,600, 8,600 divided by N2. So I've got my P1 and P2s calculated. Now, I do want to just go ahead just to, to get in the habit. I want you to always get in this habit of checking to make sure that this that we can assume normal distribution. So let's just go ahead and calculate. I'm going to call these just sample size test. Okay. So this is going to be my N1 times my P1, N1 times P1. And yep, that's greater than 5. Now I'm going to do N1 times 1 minus P1. That's greater than 5. And so over here I'm going to do N2 times P2. That's greater than 5 and into times one minus P2. 
Now, obviously these are very, very, very larger than five. I mean, we have sample sizes of 6,000 and 10,000. We can assume that those are sufficiently large to get uh, to be normally distributed. But as I said, I really just want you to get in the habit of just doing that calculation, just double checking real quick before you go any further to make sure that they are always um, greater than five, greater than or equal to five. All right, so the next thing that we need to do then is calculate our pooled uh, P value, our pooled P. So we could call that P bar, or I'm just gonna call it pooled, um, pooled probability. It's not a P value. We have too many P's here. We have P values and uh, probabilities. So this is the pooled probability. And remember that is equal to the probability of one plus the probability of two divided by the sample size of one in one plus in two. So again, we get that pooled P value. Oh, I must have done something wrong. Ah, I know what I did wrong. Silly mistake. My mistake. Goodness, see right off the bat. My numerator is not the probability, it's the number of successes. Goodness, 5,400 plus um, 8,600. See, even professors make mistakes sometimes. All right, now I get my pooled P. See, but I knew that one wasn't right because it didn't fall between my two probabilities. So let this be a lesson. Always stop and check and make sure that your answer that you get makes logical sense. And if it doesn't, you've probably made a mistake and go back and fix that before you get too far. All right, so now we've got our pooled P. Now we can come down here and calculate our Z score. Now, remember, we're going to use that first formula that we looked at because we are hypothesizing that the um, probability is greater than or equal, or really that the um, null hypothesis is less than or equal to zero. So we're going to calculate, use that first formula. So we're going to say our numerator here is P1 minus P2. And I'm going to close my parentheses. The parentheses are always where I tend to get in trouble divided by the square root of all of that stuff, right? So I'm going to open up um, the pooled P times, oh, open parentheses, 1 minus the pooled P times, I'm going to open up two parentheses here, 1 divided by N1, plus 1 divided by n2, close both of those parentheses. Now, I think I have one too many set of parentheses in there, but we still wind up with the same answer. We have a z-score of 7.4, z of 6561. So again, we could look this up in the table, or we could do that the norm.s.dot dist uh, formula to calculate it. Now, here's the hard part. This is the part that's really um, getting confusing. So we know that our z-score is 7.41. And if you think about, if you can picture that normal distribution in your head, remember the median, the mean, the right down the, z the middle is zero. So this is calculating the right far right tail at, if you imagine where there's a 0 0.741 and we're calculating what is the probability that this Z is greater than 0 0.741. So it's the probability that Z is really greater than or equal to 7 point, I'm just going to round and say 41. Okay. So since this is a greater than, remember our Excel function is always calculating the less than. It's always calculating the left tail. So I'm going to write my formula as 1 minus. Because remember the whole area under the curve is 1. So 1 minus is going to calculate what's left in that right tail. So it's that norm.s.distribution. Nope. The standard normal distribution, it tells us right there, has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we've standardized this. 
My Z score is right here in cell B11 and definitely cumulative. And so I get, again, a number that's 6.48, but it's e to the negative 14, which means it's, it's just very so slightly above zero, um, just barely above zero. So we can go in and say, sorry, I'm messing with the sample size. We can most definitely reject um, at the 0 0.05 level because this is less than 0 0.05. In fact, it's less than 0 0.01. So we can say with 99% confidence that we can reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the online shopping habits of men and women. Okay, so our results are consistent where we, we can, um, with recent research, blah, 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 let me say this, um, we conclude we can conclude that men shop online more than women, okay? So we're not accepting the alternative hypothesis, but we are rejecting the null hypothesis that says there's no difference in how men and women shop online. So we're gonna reject that, okay? Does that make sense? I hope so. Now let's do another one. So if you're following along in your textbook, I'm on page 375. We're going to look at example 11.4. If you're not following along in your book or you don't have your a printed book with you that's easy to look at, it's okay. I'm going to give you the data and we'll just come back and look at it. So I'm just going to open a new Excel spreadsheet here, just a new sheet. And we're told that this is at a wine tasting. And so there is research that shows that the more expensive a wine is, the more people tend to like it, that the price influences um, the taste of it. So this winery has conducted a survey. They've got two independent groups of people and they gave them the same wine, but to one group they told them that it was a $25 wine. And in the other group, they told them that it was a $10 wine. And so they wanted to see if the proportion of people who liked the wine was higher if they thought it was a more expensive bottle. So we're going to define N1 as our sample size with the 25, the more expensive dollar bottle of wine. And so that group was 60 people. And out of those 60 people, we're told that 48 people liked the wine. So 48 out of 60 people liked the wine. So that was 80%. So here we're told that the second group of people um, was 50, so it was a slightly smaller sample. And when they told the people that it only cost $10, now only tw um, 20 of the 50 people liked it. So same wine, but only 40 people like it. So it looks like this is a pretty significant difference, right? 80% like the wine when they thought it was a $25 bottle, 40% like the wine when they thought that it was a $10 bottle. What we really want to test though, and what we're told that we want to test, is if there it's more than a 20% difference at a 5% significance level. Now, what I don't want you to fall in the trap is and say, well, yeah, I mean, 40% to 80%, that's double, right? Um, that's, remember, that's not quite how proportions work, okay? We can't do it that. And we talked about that way earlier in the course when we talked about qualitative data, remember we talked about ratio data and things like that. This is qualitative data. So we can say that more people liked it, but we can't say that people liked it twice as much, okay? So we want to test if more than 20% of the people liked it. So our alternative hypothesis, which I'm going to call HA, is that more than 20% of the people liked the more expensive wine than the cheap wine. So we're going to say P1 minus P2 is greater than 20%. Okay. So we think that that difference is more than 20%. So now we've got just a one-tailed test, but we're going to have to use that second formula there because 
if we're testing not that it's equal to zero. So now our null hypothesis, which we're going to call H0, is that P1 minus P2 is less than or equal to 20%. So either there's no difference or there's a difference that's less than 20%, assuming a 5% significance level. Okay, so now first thing that we want to do is calculate, do our sample size test. So let's just call that over here, sample size test. So we want to test that N1 times P1 is greater than or equal to five, which it is. We want to test that N1 times one minus P1 is greater than or equal to five. Oh, what did I do here? Oh, I've chose A1 instead of A2. There we go, that's what I did. Goodness. A2, oh, I want B2, goodness, B1. Goodness gracious, that B1 times one minus B2. There we go. Whew. Well, that is greater than or equal to five. So now we're gonna do the same thing for our sample size two, N2 times P2, and N2 times one minus P2. There we go. Now they're all greater than five, so we can assume they're normally distributed. Now, I don't have to calculate a pooled P here because I'm assuming that the difference is, I'm not testing that the difference is zero. So I'm going to just jump straight in to my Z formula. Now, again, I hope you're looking at the formula, the second formula that we looked at. So our Z formula is going to be equal to our numerator now is P1 minus P2 now minus that difference, that D0, which was 0.2. All of that divided by the square root of, all right, this is gonna get ugly, P1 times one minus P1 divided by N1 plus, in more parentheses, P2 times one minus P2 divided by N2 and we get a z-score of 2.31455. So this is really testing, again, the probability that Z is greater than 2.31. Now here's a clue, you can always look at your alternative hypothesis. If your alternative hypothesis is greater than, then it, you're looking at a right tail test. If your alternative hypothesis is less than, you're looking at a left tail test. So now I can look up my Z score in that Z table, or I can calculate the P value by using that, again, it's gonna be one minus norm.s.distribution, where the z-score, and it is cumulative, and I get 0 0.01. So we can reject the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level to say that yes, 20% of the people do like the more expensive wine, or influenced by price and would choose a more expensive wine. Now, notice that the p-value is 0 0.0103. So we can't reject the null hypothesis if we were using a 1% significance level or with 99% confidence, okay? Now, I'm gonna repeat something that my one of my professors used to say, because we used to like to say when I was doing research, and let's say that we were using a 99% confidence level, and we could say, well, it's almost, we can almost reject the null hypothesis with 99% confidence or at a 1% significance level because it's almost less than 0.1. And she used to tell us st statistical significance is like pregnancy. You either are or you aren't. There's no almost. Okay. So if we were using a 99% confidence 
level or 1% significance level, we could not reject the null hypothesis. And we can't say, well, we could almost reject it or it was close to being rejected. Just no, you can't reject it. We can reject it at a 95% confidence level or at a 5% significance level, but we can't be 99% confident that 20% of the people like the um, more expensive wine.